Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Story Hive content creator chat. This special chat is a discussion with Marsha Green. And Marsha has been a writer for Global's Private Eyes and Departure, ABC's 10 Days in the Valley, and CBC's hit series Coroner, and was nominated for three Canadian Screen Awards for her work as the showrunner on season three of Global Lifetime's Mary Kills People. Most notably, she is the co-creator and showrunner of the Emmy-nominated series, The Porter on CBC, which was recently nominated for a Canadian Screen Award. I am Amira Anderson, the creator of Amara, which was funded through the Tell a Story Hive Black Creators Edition in partnership with Black Screen Office with contributions from Creative BC. Uh, just a quick acknowledgement before we get started, I reside and work from the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. If you'd like to put um, the lands that you're working from in the comment, that would be awesome. This conversation is made possible by Telus Story Hive, supporting the production of compelling, locally reflective content by new and emerging content creators and filmmakers in BC and Alberta, and connecting them to viewers from diverse identities and communities. Today, we also have Liz doing ASL interpretation. Thank you so much, Liz. And let me know if I'm going too fast. <laughs> um, all right. So welcome, Marsha. Thank you. So Thank you to have you here. Um, so my first question for you is, what is the first story you remember telling? Um, okay, the first story I remember telling, uh, I actually don't remember how old I was, but I told my sister this elaborate story of how I met Michael Jackson. And <laughs> it was because she went, I think she went to a Jackson 5 concert or something of that nature. Um, and, and I didn't get to go. And so I was like, oh, it's okay, because I actually have already met Michael Jackson. And I told the story about how I was walking down the street and like he dropped something and I picked it up and he was so grateful. He gave me like a ticket to a show. It was this very, and she would like ask me questions like, oh, what, you know, what about this? And, and I always had an answer. And I just like wove this very long, all lies story of how I met Michael Jackson. Did she believe you or was she like suspicious? No, she was suspicious and she still, <laughs> she remembers, she remembers it. She's just always, <laughs> like she, she remembers me telling her this, this story and she's my older sister. So it must've been particularly uh, funny to her to have her like little sister trying to convince her of this thing that was so obviously, it was like, why were you walking down the street alone when you're six years old? You know, it was like, kind of <laughs> like. <laughs> yeah. Um, well. So that's how you started storytelling. Um, how did you get started in writing for film and TV specifically? Yeah, well, you know, before I was a television writer, I worked in marketing and advertising for many years. Um, but there were, and I was a copywriter. And so there was kind of an element of writing in the job, but I wasn't getting to tell stories and it was all that I wanted to do. And so I kind of just took stock after about eight years or something. And, and I was like, you know, what is it that I really want to do? And by that point, um, I was, had really become like obsessed with television. I watched everything. I was like the human guide for my friends. They would call me and be like, it's Wednesday, what's on? And, and so I just started to look into it. I got I started to like read books about it and, and things like that. And I really felt like TV was the right place for me because of my love for it, but also because um, television writing as opposed to film writing is very collaborative. And I really wanted that uh, in, in a job. I didn't want to just be kind of by myself writing. I, I loved to work with other people. Um, and so then I applied to Humber's TV writing and producing program. Um, and, and that kind of began the journey, but after, so when I graduated from that program, I worked in production for about three or four years. Um, and then I realized as anybody who works in production knows, I just didn't have very much time to write because I was working these very long hours. And so I felt like I needed to re kind of refocus, um, again. And, uh, so I applied to the CFC. Um, and then uh, that kind of was the, the beginning of the career I have now. I got my first kind of big job about a year later and 
um, I've only worked as a television writer since. That's awesome. Um, do you mind if I ask what that first big job was? Yes, it was on uh, Private Eyes, which I think mm -hmm. was the first credit you mentioned. And so I was hired as the script coordinator in that room. And, um, and then I got half a script as I was, uh, even as the script coordinator, I got half a script, which I co-wrote the script with Tassie Cameron. And then kind of miraculously, a few months later, they promoted me to just be a story editor in the room. And they made, uh, there was another assistant there who was the showrunner's assistant and she moved up into the script coordinator position um, and kind of did double duty. And so I never actually did an entire show as a script coordinator. I think I only actually did the job for the first two episodes, um, but it was it was amazing. And I had had some reservations about taking that script coordinator job because I felt like I was like farther along, I was a bit older, et cetera, but it was such a great opportunity. I, I decided to just go for it. And then I was very fortunate that the showrunners kind of recognized that I, you know, could contribute more to the room. Mm, that's awesome. Um, so the next question that I have for you is what inspires you? I feel very inspired just by people in like everyday life. I kind of say that I'm like a low concept person. I, I just... I can watch two people in a room talking and that's endlessly entertaining to me. And so I feel like even this work I used to do in production in a way, because when you're working in, I worked in reality television and, and so it's all about real people. You have real contestants. I worked on big brother Canada. And so I was, I would just watch people for eight hours a day and see <laughs> how they interacted and see what they talked about. Um, and so I just, and I, and that was one of the best jobs I ever had <laughs> to this day. Um, yeah, I just, I find people very interesting. And then I find as a writer, it just, to me, it's kind of what grounds what we do and what I do. I'm always really trying to look at it from the perspective of that character. Like what would a person do in this situation and, and really trying to make that uh, real and authentic and uh, emotionally resonant. Mm -hmm. So you have been writing from the time you started on Private Eyes. You show ran the third season of Mary Kills People and season one of The Porter came out and that's your own show that you were show running as well. So what was it like writing for a show that you didn't create versus the one that you did? Um, it definitely is a different experience because with Mary, I had worked on Mary for all of the seasons. So it was actually my my second, kind of my second big job was to work on Mary. So by the time I was show running it, in a way, it was a great first showrunner gig because I knew the show so well. I knew the voices so well. I knew what instinctively felt right for those characters. I had kind of been on the whole journey it was the whole, everything was established. Like that was the thing about walking into show running season three, everything is, is established. So then doing the porter, it's so different. Like you're building it all from the ground up and there is no playbook of like what's right for the show or the characters or the world. You really have to design it yourself and think about um, what's the story you wanna tell, what's the best way to tell it, how do you support that? visually and with music and all of these other things it, it was I, I don't think I understood fully the magnitude of what it is to create a show uh from the very beginning um I was like there's no title card there's no soundtrack sound cues there's just nothing so you're really choosing every detail and you know people will talk about this you're choosing the wallpaper in like the living room every mm -hmm. decision kind of matters and will tell your story in some way. So that was, so those two experience, it was kind of good to get my feet wet in a way on Mary Kills People, a show that was established and that I knew and be able to take those skills to the porter and then, and, and apply them. And in terms of the writing, in a way it was, it's different because you're kind of, 
I would say partially, I mean, obviously the porter has an entirely black cast. So you're accessing different parts of yourself as you're telling those stories. Um, and then because we created those characters, we were, you always kind of, I think, infuse characters with the little bits of who you are. And mm -hmm. so I think that that writing process um, was was different. It, I mean, it's never easy, but the, with Mary, it was like, I knew it so well, it was like a part of my DNA. And with the Porter, it was more like it kind of came from my DNA. And so then I, that made it easier. That's such a cool way of putting it. I love that. <laughs> Um, so with the, the world and the story of the Porter, what drew you to this story and why did the world need to hear the story of the Porter right now? Well, what's interesting is that, you know, we felt like the world needed the story of the Porter in 2017. <laughs> that was, mm -hmm. that was when I started on it. And when I started, I was not the showrunner. Um, but it, it was like, it was in development. And what drew me to the story then was that I felt there were a lot of historical pieces in which black people kind of weren't in the story or if they were, they were in the background and people would always say, well, you know, that was the time. And I was like, well, why isn't anybody looking for the stories where black people are at the center? And so, and then of course, when they are at the center, it's so often a story of slavery you mm -hmm. know, like that narrative had been told so much. So the Porter, to me, just had this, it was like this true story, this moment in history where it actually was about these Black Porters and, and what they did. And um, Arnold Pinnock, one of the other creators, would always say, like, if you watch an old movie, you'll see the Porters, like, in the background, you know, people will be on the train and you'll see them there serving people. And so to be able to like write this show and those scenes on the train where it's like the porter is actually the star of the story and the white people are in the background of their story was just incredible and such a wonderful thing to put uh, into the world. So that was kind of, I felt like that was why, what drew me to it and also what at the time when we finally did make it, it did feel like in 2020, obviously, um, was when we started and with the pandemic and, and everything that was happening in the world, it felt even more important to center Black stories. For sure. Um, you just mentioned uh, Arnold Pinnock, which is one of your co-creators, and then you also work with Anne-Marie Murray, yes? Um, so how did you start working with them? I, so I first started working with them in that development room in 2017. I didn't know Arnold except outside of him being an actor that I had seen on television shows. Um, and then Anne Marie was, uh, I had met her once in, in the bathroom of a, we were both, we were in two different story rooms and, and there was a, in one building. And so there was a bathroom in the building. And one day I went in and she was there and we met. And I remember, I always remembered it because at this time, this was 20, that was 2014. And so there were, I didn't know any other black writers. So I had heard that there was this other female black writer who had done a lot of shows that was Anne Marie. So it was kind of this like pokeroo moment where I saw her uh, in the bathroom for that brief moment. And I literally never saw her again <laughs> until oh the writers <laughs> of the Porter. Um, and so, yeah, so we were, so uh, Arnold and Anne Marie and I were all in the room. So Arnold had come, had kind of come with the series idea and we started to work on it. Um, and then the show didn't go forward from that point. Um, and so then they approached Anne-Marie and I to take it over as showrunners. And so for the next year and a half or so, Anne-Marie and I worked on it, just the two of us. And it was obviously with the feedback of, of our partners, but it would often be just Anne-Marie and I in a room kind of breaking the story and making it work. And it, it ended up being such a good experience because it meant that we really understood each other, um, understood what our own strengths were, um, how to work together. And then when we were finally going into making it and going into the writer's room, we had that unified vision of what we wanted the show to be and what we wanted to say. And, and sometimes um, today it's like you have a show and then they bring on a showrunner 
And then now you're making the show together and you don't have that time to build that relationship and get that uh, hive mind, as they say. I mean, Anne-Marie and I feel really fortunate that we got that time. Um, as frustrating as it is to be in development, it allowed us to really find that common voice between the two of us to make and develop the show together. That sounds like an absolute dream. <laughs> it sounds like so much fun. Um, so you've worked with Anne-Marie and Arnold. If you could have a dream team of anyone you're not currently working with, um, writers, directors, actors, showrunners, what would your team be? Okay, so I feel like there are so many people that I would like to work with. So I just want to preface what I say by saying <laughs> A few names like popped into my head and okay so the first name that popped into my head was Issa Rae I mean I don't think I need to explain why mm -hmm. um someone I think already said that their favorite uh piece by a black by a black creator is insecure it's definitely one of my favorites too but I just find her so inspiring as a person, but also just as a storyteller, I think she's always looking to push the boundaries and do something kind of different. So I think it would be really exciting to work with someone and see how, where she starts from and how she gets there. Um, I was recently talking to a friend of mine um, and she was watching Bad Sisters, which I had also watched, which is Sharon Horgan. And we were just like, what would it be like to work with her? Like, I don't need, feel like I don't even know much about her. So in a way I was like, it'd be like a peek behind the curtain of someone whose work I admire. Um, and then, oh, Viola Davis, because oh, yeah. like a queen, like I, you know, I don't know if you follow Viola Davis on Instagram, but even like her Instagram is just amazing. And uh, yeah, I love her. Um, and she's such an incredible actor. I mean, like, look, I don't have to say, that. I know that we all know that, but to write for somebody who you know has that range just would be so exciting. Um, and then just to like shout out a few Canadian peeps, um, Lavelle Adams Gray, is an actor that I remember, uh, he also went to the Canadian Film Center and I remember seeing his actor's showcase piece and just being so blown away and thinking like, wow, this, this guy is so incredible. And then a few years later, I went to like a script reading and he read one of the parts and he, it was like, he was just reading the script and it was so good. And when we did the Porter, we we really wanted him um, for for some role on the show, just because we we all love him and admire him and it, and it couldn't work out because of course, you know, he's very busy and on um, power and, you know, doing amazing things. But I, I just think that he's great and I would love to work with him. Um, and then also Corey Bowles, who's a direct Canadian director who I was recently in a story room with. Um, and so, which we were just kind of all working together as writers, but I would be really interested in working with Corey as a director. He's such a unique person. Um, and also we had a long conversation about how showrunners and directors work together. And I just really liked the way that he approached that relationship. It's so important when you're making a show. And I felt like, oh, I, I would, yeah, I would love for this show that we were working on to get made so that I could write an episode and have Corey direct it and kind of see, even though I was not the showrunner of that show, but uh, I just thought it would be fun. So those are some people I'd like to work with. Amazing. That does sound like a dream team. <laughs> um, so what is the first thing you do when you start a new project? Like, how do you keep yourself on track? How do you keep yourself accountable? Any tips on that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> the face. I mean, I feel like, to be honest, I'm not great at keeping myself accountable. So I don't know that I can offer anybody any tips. What I did um, at the beginning of this year was I joined this program, which was through, oh man, through Scriptapalooza, I believe, oh, okay. of the organization. No, that's not right. It's... <laughs> It's Script Anatomy. Script Anatomy, I believe, okay. is the name of the organization. And the program I did was called Pilot Palooza. Gotcha. And 
was to write a pilot in one month. And so it, it was 30 days. So every day you would go on and there would be an assignment that you did and you had to finish it. And so for me, I mean, obviously I've written pilots before. Um, so it wasn't so much for the instruction, although the instruction was very helpful, but it was for the accountability that every day I was gonna get an email that said, you have to work on this and I had to do it. And so I did really well up until outline. <laughs> then it was hard, just to be honest, but it's still, you know what? I feel like I still got farther than I would have had I been left to my own devices. Mm -hmm. um, and partially that has to do with kind of your, the first part of your question, which was, what's the first thing you do? I like to just kind of have the idea kind of in my head, rolling around my head for a while. And then I just write down random things that come to me, like maybe like a scene or a line or a piece of voiceover um, or a story from my own life that I think would, would really fit into this idea. So I end up so that process kind of can kind of go on for a long time. And then you can't see in my office, I've cleverly hidden it, but all <laughs> along here, there are sticky notes of uh, random ideas that I've had for this pilot that I, that I started uh, in the beginning of the year. And I also like to do a lot of, I like to do research. I feel like what's good about it is it's not as intimidating as writing, but it it will give you ideas. It will mm -hmm. give you ideas. So it is still like you're kind of doing the work, but you don't feel as afraid to start just doing some research, you know? Yeah. So that's usually what I do, research and random ideas. And then I find a way to force myself to be accountable. So that's either that program or maybe going on a writer's retreat with my friends. We'll like run a cottage for five days and then be like, this is what I'm going to finish in this time. And then you're with other people who are doing their work. So you feel like you need to do your work and at <laughs> the end you're going to have something. So that's probably the other way I most often keep myself accountable. Okay. Um, so on that note, these writers that you go away with on these writers retreats, um, do you have any advice for new writers on how to build community and make those connections? Yes. Okay, so the, these writers that I, actually these writers that I go away with most often are also from the CFC, um, but are not from my year at the CFC. They're from the year after me at the CFC. And I'm also, you know, close with some of the writers who are from the year before me at the CFC. So that's just to say, you know, so when you're in a program, the people, oh, sorry, the light's getting a little crazy here. Um, when you're in a program, there's the, people that you're that are in your program um, that you might meet and keep in touch with which is a great touchstone for you to have people to read things for you or recommend you or whatever it may be but then that organization or that school that you've gone to they maybe have events and it's good to go to those events and meet graduates from other programs because that's just you're creating those degrees of separation, right? Like now you're connected to this person and you don't know who they're connected to that might come in handy for you one day. So I think that like to kind of put yourself out there and try and connect with people, even just writers who are at your own level, I think that's really important because that builds community. Um, keeping in touch with people, I think is very important. Um, I've kept in touch with people the very first job I ever had in television, um, period, I was an assistant to a showrunner. And it was in 2010. And it was probably for like, I don't know, maybe four months, five months. And I still talk to some of those people to this day. <laughs> like, I just always kept in touch with them, you know, and one of them gave me a job, like, after I graduated from the CFC. So you really never know. Um, what contact you have that is going to come in handy. And then I guess the other thing I always tell new writers is to try and put yourself out there and like to push yourself a little. Like I think when I first started out, when I went to Humber, I was quite um, nervous about reaching out to people I didn't know well 
um, being like, do you want to have a coffee or whatever? I felt so uncomfortable with about it. And um, I had an instructor there who just kind of said, you have to have no shame. And I think that that was really good advice because it just made me push myself a little outside of my comfort zone. And that really paid off. So I always tell people that like, you know, you might not be a person who wants to go to every party and talk to everybody that might not be your personality, but you could push yourself to reach out to one person, just an email, just a coffee, just to make that connection. And, and you never know how that could come back to help you. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to completely change the topic. Um, I would love to know what your favorite genre is to write in. And after that, what world do you hope to work on next? Um, my favorite genre to write in is drama, mm -hmm. but with a little bit of comedy. I like to have a little bit of lightness in in what I in what I write. And so and I I feel like you know, I've written things that are definitely darker and more serious, but I am very often the person who is kind of pitching the lighter moment or a funny moment. And I remember when I worked on 10 Days in the Valley, I co-wrote an episode with another writer and he did, he wrote the A story, which was kind of a serious it was the cop and the woman whose daughter was missing. And I did the B and C stories, which was like, you know, the daughter accidentally does drugs and, you know, <laughs> with this person or whatever, you know, like I chose the lighter, the lighter story. Um, Cause that's kind of my favorite thing. And then what world do I want to work on next? Is that what? Yeah. Like, um, like a children's fantasy drama. Uh, you did the Porter is a period yeah. drama, like comedy. I mean, you just yeah. said you love drama, but yes, but I, but it's true. I actually am, I think moving a little bit more to comedy. I don't know that I feel confident enough to just write a straight up comedy, but I am pushing myself to be more in the kind of dramedy space. So mm -hmm. I've typically done one hours with a little bit, with some lightness, like a light one hour. And now I'm trying to do more like a dramatic half hour. You know, so it's it's kind of half caught, like a dramedy, as they as they say. So that I'm working on actually three different things right now that are in that space. So that's my that's where I have my I I love because I find that that's what I'm watching so much, like Insecure. Um, yeah. Uh, anyways, a uh, flea bag. Um, mm -hmm. so many shows I could name. Work in progress. Uh, but yeah, I find myself very attracted to that kind of half hour dramedy space. So I figured I should try and write it. And to my, to one of the questions you said earlier, um, those shows tend to be more low concept, like a one hour usually needs a stronger engine, like story engine, or is more high concept and more plot driven. Whereas um, half hours are, are usually character pieces. And so you kind of end up with that two people in a room talking, which is my favorite thing. <laughs> awesome. I can't wait to see what you're working on next. So exciting. I hope you get to see it one day. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, out of all the characters that you've written or produced, who would you want to be versus who do you think you are in reality? Okay. Who I would want to be um, I, okay, so who I would want to be in most ways is Miss Queenie <laughs> from The Border. <laughs> Not because it's like, obviously I don't want to be a gangster, but <laughs> she was so, you know, this is like a self-made woman mm -hmm. who was like holding her own against like these like notorious gangsters she, you know, ha she had a lot of money. She had this thriving business doing, running numbers. Um, she was, and at the same time, she was helping the black community. She was educating the black community. She was kind of paying it forward. And also she was um, quite known for her fashion. She was very, she was like a fashionista of the time. 
um, I will not be known as a fashionista of my time. So that would be great. <laughs> and also to just be that, uh, yeah, that inspiring and confident and bold. I think she's very bold and I find myself attracted to those characters and writing those characters. Um, who do I relate to most in reality? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the first person that came to mind when actually speaking of what you were like, oh, I hope I get to see what you write. This is like a classic example because I wrote this character for a show that I developed that I that never ended up getting made. And I felt like she was really similar to me, even though she had a life that was totally different than mine, but it was like her voice, like her humor, her sarcasm, her relationship with her sisters. It was very, very similar to my own experience. And I loved writing that show. But just to give a reference that people might know, I think that I would say I'm a lot like Marlene in The Porter because I'm like a combo of Marlene and Lucy. Like I think that with Lucy, she's very like effervescent and she you know, has this dream and she'll do anything for it. And I feel like that's very much me. But Marlene also has this kind of moral compass. And what I loved about Marlene as a character was that it wasn't just that she was like, this is good, this is bad, but there was nuance there for her, you know? And so there was a nuance to what she considered good and bad. And she worked within those parameters for herself. And partially <laughs> that was because she herself um, was very ambitious. And I, so I really related to that in her. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I hope we get to see this Abby character one day. Oh, no. So curious now. <laughs> um, so what kind of stories do you think the industry is looking for right now in general? I think, and I'm saying this partially because I recently heard this, um, but I heard that people are looking for more personal, authentic stories. And I don't know if the personal is, I don't know if it's necessarily that it's personal. I think it's like what people are responding to is the authenticity, which mm. so often comes from a personal experience. And so I think people are looking for you know, there's been a lot of content that's very broad and has mass appeal, as they say. And I think what we've um, come to see over the last couple of years is the way something that is in fact quite specific can also have this mass appeal to like get, look, you know, peek in the window of something, you know, to like watch Atlanta to so specifically in this place and with these people. And yet I remember going to this uh, restaurant with another writer and there was a woman sitting next to us um, who heard us talking. We were both, and could hear us talking about TV. And this was like a woman, honestly, you would never think she watched Atlanta. She was like, we were in Toronto, but I think she was like from Texas or something. And she was like, kind of, I don't know, maybe like in her fifties, blonde with her husband. And then she was just like, I love Atlanta. I think it's so funny. So I'm like that. Anyways, that's mm -hmm. what I do think people are looking for. I think they're looking for something that is authentic and that, that there's something in that authenticity that creates a universal appeal. And maybe what we've come to understand is that um, there are themes even within a story that's very specific, that are universal. And so when you can find that kind of, that the, the marriage of those two things, you know, with the Porter, we always felt like this is a story about underdogs, you know, that's, not, which is not like, there are many people who can be underdogs who are coming up against these corporate giants and trying to fight for their rights. That is a universal story. It's a story many people will know. So that was kind of for us, the theme we were, kind of going with more so than even though it was specifically set in this black community and around this time. Yeah, awesome. Um, so what advice would you give to your past self when you first decided to become a writer slash show creator? This is a good question <laughs> because sometimes I get 
asked like, what advice would I give writers in general, which is always a bit harder for me because I so much feel like you've got to go through the steps yourself. Like, even if I told you something, mm-hmm. you just have to go through the steps yourself. But looking back to my past self, one of the things that I, I feel like I would tell my past self is that I had this job that was like a really bad situation for me. And I just stayed for so long, even though it was a bad situation and kind of, I think, allowed myself. I'm like questioning my use of the word allow myself, but I think I was a kind of, I was a bullied in this situation and I didn't stand up for myself. And I didn't do that because I was afraid. And it was like, I was so new and I didn't know what effect it was going to have on my career. But the, and I guess if I were to tell my past self, I would say what is more important is how you feel and how you're being treated than your career. At that time, I didn't have that perspective. Being successful was the most important thing to me. And so it felt like everything I did or everything I went through was to that goal. Whereas now looking back, I have a much different uh, perspective on people um, not just advocating for themselves, but just taking care of themselves. You know, like you need to do you need to make sure that you are taking care of yourself as a human being, uh, I think before as a, as a writer or before your career, that's what I would tell myself. That makes sense. I feel that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So that's all the questions that I have for you. Thank you so much for answering them. Thank you. Uh, Great question. Thank you. So I'm just going to check the chat here and see if we have any other questions. Okay, great. Oh, okay. So we have one person who is grieving the loss of the porter. Can you talk a little bit about why that was canceled? (laughs) The word heartbreaking is used here. (laughs) Oh, that's so nice. Yeah. You know, the porter was an incredibly difficult show to make for Mm -hmm. for so many reasons but it's actually and it's related to why it didn't get made um back in 2017 you know one of the things I admired so much about our producer um which was Sienna Films now Sphere Media at that time was that you know they were trying to get financing for the show and that was difficult And then we had this choice to make, like, do we make a show for less money, you know, for, for what, you know, and, and then we were like, we want to make this beautiful, like premium cable looking show. And we don't want to sacrifice that just to get it made Mm because it would be doing a disservice to the show itself. And so that's partially why we waited and reworked it and all of these things and eventually got to make it, which was great. Um, But yeah, so it's a show that, which is just all to say that it's a show that definitely needs a partner. And once the Porter lost its American partner, there just wasn't a way to keep it going. And I think it is hard to, um, a show like the Porter, it's so funny because I feel like I'm, I was talking about authenticity and specificity. But sometimes that can make a show difficult to travel. Like, I think that's definitely um, something that is changing or maybe depends on where it comes from. But, you know, we purposely made the show set in Canada, very obviously in this Canadian, like in Canada, in Montreal, using the dialect of the Caribbean and whatever. And those things can make a show, you know, harder to to sell and get other people on board. So that's, yeah, that's kind of the situation. You know, I think we always, you know, we could have gone on. Um, We had ideas for what the show would be, but I also, I know that Emery and I both, like we wrote that season knowing that it was going to end with Zeke saying, I'm going to start this black union. 
And in some ways that what from that point on was the story that people kind of knew or was the story that was easy to find. And the other stuff was kind of leading up to that. So we had always felt there's a way in which this could be just this limited series, this one season of like, when we get to this point, and then we know after this point, what happens and we could go on or we couldn't. And I wrote the last episode um, of the season, which now turns out to be the last episode of the series. Um, so, and I wrote it kind of with that in mind, where it had that a little bit of a feeling of finality, uh, you know, where we know where they're going, but also a little feeling of hope that some of these characters might go on and achieve even more. Yeah. Well, that's like a hopeful note is always nice, especially when they've been through so much throughout the season and <laughs> just like, yeah. Um, Brittany Tip Lady wants to know, um, Marsha, we as creatives talk a lot about how challenging creative careers are, but I'd love to know about your joys. What do you love most about this job? Well, I um, I actually, I always refer to the writer's room as my happy place. I love being in the writer's room. And even right now for the last, um, I guess since uh, maybe the summer of last year, I've been focused on developing, like just having meetings and writing my own scripts and taking pitches. But every now and then I'll just join a writer's room. Like if someone has a development room and they're like, we need somebody for two weeks or we need someone for a month, I'll do it because it brings me so much joy. And as much as they're, my focus right now is creating a show on my own and kind of starting from the ground up again, um, I feel like it's really important to, I just feel energized and fueled by working with other people in the writer's room. So that brings me joy about the job. And also, I think there's something kind of, um, there's like a magic in writing where you're writing something and it takes a turn or you're writing something and it calls back to something you wrote before in a way you didn't plan. That's so right. And it's like, that's the magic. I mean, I love that about writing where, you know, you kind of, I'm very much a, uh, I like to kind of plan it all out. I have an outline. I know what it is, but partially I do that so that the structure is all in place. And then I can just be free to write within that structure. Like if the structure is off, then I feel like that other part of my brain is working too much to like, let the magic come in. So if I kind of have the framework together, then I feel like I just sit and write and then kind of magical things happen. And those are the things that you can't plan. And yeah. then that makes me happy. Um, just going back to what you were saying about the writer's room, uh, we have another question. It says, now that you're the showrunner, are there any particular qualities you look for when staffing your writer's room? Yes, I like... I like people who are willing to be uh, vulnerable and share their stories. Um, and I know that that's not easy. And I think what's really important as the showrunner is to create the environment for people to do that. So that's something that I have to do if it's something that I want. But it kind of speaks to... Um, like what I'm attracted to or what inspires me, like real people and real stories and real emotions. So when people open up and they, you know, they'll tell you a story and you're like, oh, that's so interesting that that's how you felt or that's what you did. And I just feel like that's where you get, you know, all of like the heart and like the juice of what you're working on. And so I kind of always, I'm like, when I'm in a room and people say we're working on an idea and people are just throwing ideas. You know, what about this? What about this? What about this? It's like, I'm just like, just pause. Like, what would you do in the, like, what would we do? Like, let's just like, not try and think about plot, but like about people in situations, how they feel. And if they feel this way, how do they react to that? And what do they do? And so I love people who are, um, who like, like to pitch a lot of ideas that's very important in a room. Um, and I definitely look for people like that, but 
it's equally important to me to have someone who maybe isn't pitching all the time, but is really kind of uh, looking at the material from that emotional character point of view. So I expect that. I look for that and yeah, I look for that and want that. And then what else do I, I, is this like if I was staffing a room? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. So if I was staffing a room outside, that would be something that maybe, you know, it's kind of hard to know before, but you would have an interview. I think if I'm reading a script, what I'm looking for is someone with that you know, who kind of has a voice and point of view. And I know that those things can be kind of vague, but um, it's like, if I read something and I'm like, oh my God, I never would have thought of that. Then I feel excited because it's like, yeah, I want someone in the room who's going to come up with something that I would have never thought of. Mm. So as I said, like I very much uh, I'm a very much a structure person. So that's something that I don't necessarily look for as much when I'm staffing a room because I know that's how my brain works. So I'm much more likely to look for somebody who has the kind of other qualities that I feel like I'm not bringing as much. And so it's like when I'm reading and I see, yeah, I see something and I'm like, oh, I never would have thought of that. I, I think that's like, yeah, I yeah, that gets me excited would make me want to meet that person. I also just go, I will just also say I've always been this way, but I am like kind of a person who does go off vibes, like just meeting and talking to people. <laughs> so that's not, but it's true. Like, I definitely think that the work is important and your work ethic is incredibly important. But I also like when I'm in an interview, I want someone to be themselves. Like, I just feel like I want to get to know you because we're going to be trapped in this room together. And like, we need that to work. So. Vibes. All right. Vibes. Love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> while we're on the topic of writers rooms, we have a question. Do you have any advice for writers on writing great, believable dialogue? Hmm. Great, believable dialogue. Um, I don't, I guess this is what I think, the way I approach it is that every word that they say should count and should matter. And so I think usually what I'll do, I'll just write, just like write a bunch of things. And then I'll do that, um, that thing you can do in, in your script writing program where you can print out a report of the dialogue of one character. And then, so what you'll see is just like, so say it was like Marlene, you will just see all of Marlene's lines in a row. And then I get to see, does every line she say feel authentically Marlene? Like she has a personality, she has a point of view. She, the way Marlene talks shouldn't sound the same as how Lucy talks. So then I look through that and then I like look and be like, okay, what's she saying? What's a more Marlene way of saying that? I think the dialogue and the believability really needs to come out of um, personality and character traits so that when you create um, so that uh, that sometimes when you don't quite have the voice, it's about going back to the character and defining the character more. And then you can kind of see, oh, that's how this person talks. Because sometimes it's just tiny, it's like word choices, you know what I mean? That that will tell you, um, you know, people always say this about uh, um, like women use the word just way more than men or something like that, like things like yeah. that, right? Ways in which, you know, you like kind of use something. The, someone once told me actually, men never say just. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but a writer said that to me. And then now truly, every time I write a man and he goes, I was just saying when I was like, would he say just? Or would he say, I'm saying blah, blah, blah. I'm like, maybe he would be more forceful. Um, anyway, so that's kind of how I approach it, which is just, I mean, let yourself like be free to write and kind of have them reveal themselves to you. But I do like to go back and make sure I'm making every line feel authentic from to that character and what they would say. 
Yeah, like let them reinforce themselves almost. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So Especially cool. in a pilot when people are getting to know the characters, you know, you really want their dialogue to tell you about them. And then you can be like, oh, that's the funny one. You know, that's the angry one or whatever. <laughs> Makes sense. I'm gonna have to try that. Um, so we're gonna try to do a rapid fire to get through the rest of these questions. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. Um, what are you watching and loving right now? <laughs> uh, the Last of Us. Okay. Uh, who are your heroes? Uh, Issa Rae, Viola Davis, <laughs> uh, Shonda Rhimes, um, uh, Oprah. I don't know. <laughs> All right, this one, mm, this is not very rapid. <laughs> one second. Um, okay, you can take up more time with this one, but it is, has grant funding been integral in your content creation process? And do you have any tips for emerging creators who are looking for grants? Um, grants have not been a huge part of my personal journey. I did get a Bravo fact grant um, early on. And so, and I got to make a little short film, which was great. But I would say that was better for me as a learning experience than it was as a career move. Like it didn't necessarily like open any doors for me, possibly because I'm a TV writer. So having written this short film wasn't quite connecting. Um, however, now, um, right now I'm, uh, I got the grant, which is called the CMF early development, wait, CMF, early stage development fund, I think. Um, and so that is a fund that's uh, specific to writers. And there are two, I think there are two streams. One is like, you have to have uh, like a certain amount of credits. And the other one um, is for uh, writers from diverse backgrounds. Um, and so right now, so I applied for that grant um, and I got it. And so for the last year or so, I've been writing a pilot through that program. And that's really great because most of the time, as you know, you, you write work for free, you know, you write your work for free. And so that fund is a chance for you to write something that, uh, to tell the story you want to tell and actually pay yourself for it. And uh, the way the fund works is that you, you know, you have to submit a budget and do all of this stuff. Um, but if it never goes anywhere, you got the money to do it. And it then, and hopefully, but the idea is, is that you're going to go out and pitch that script. And then if you sell it, then you pay CMF back uh, the money, which will be fine because you'll have so much money from selling your show. You'll be able to afford it. So yeah. So in, in, the rapid fire uh, version is it hasn't in, in the past played a big role, but you know, it might be that this script that I got to write through CMF ends up being the next show I make. So I might have a different answer in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, killed the rapid fire. Great job. <laughs> and thank you for doing this content creator chat. Appreciate this so much. Thank you for letting me ask all these questions. Um, yeah, um, just before we end this, I want to thank everyone in the chat for your questions. Um, and so after this uh, stream ends, we just wanna invite you to take the post-event survey for a chance to win a $100 prepaid MasterCard. So the link should be in the chat, both on the Zoom and on Facebook Live. Yes. Oh. So there's a lot of thank yous here, Marsha. Everyone is saying thank you so much for doing this. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just want to convey that. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Those were great questions. Thank you, Liz, for keeping up with us. <laughs> um, and thank, thank you, everybody who came and asked questions. And I wish you all luck. And I hope I get to see you uh, one day. Maybe we'll have a live event one day that we'll get to do. Uh, live in person, I guess an in-person event, but this is great. I'm glad I got to do it. All right. I'm going to turn this back over to Christy. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>